So hi everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Nduta Wambura and if you're new in, to this channel, then you know what you need to do, subscribe um, and, and share this live uh, session, of course, to, with someone else who might benefit from, from these sessions. Like I keep saying, um, this is an Ubuntu YouTube channel where I, I like to talk about uh, different things about a study abroad, life abroad, sometimes about nutrition. So please feel free to uh, reach out to us as well on the comment section. Tell us where you're you listening us from. Um, and, and if you're listening to this much later, of course, you can leave your comment and let us know where uh, you have been listening um, the session from. So it's always nice to know where everybody is from so that you can be able to get um, the right content for the right audience and for the right time, really. Um, it's amazing to have you guys on board. So thank you so much for joining us on this session. My name is Nduta Wambura. I, um, I, I wear several hats. And uh, on this occasion, I just really want to speak to one of a um, very good friend of mine for quite a long time, a guest, of, um, a guest speaker today, uh, who is actually someone who's gone through the Africa Comp Fellowship. So as you might have seen, the title of this session is How to Apply for Africa Comp uh, Fellowship. And I might just be saying that wrong. So I will ask him to, to even correct me whether I'm pronouncing that correctly. And if not, of course, um, you know, let me know whether, whether you know, I should change that. But guys, uh, today's session is going to be very interactive. As always, we... Um, want to answer all your questions if you have any questions about maybe life in germany as well then this is a platform that you can actually ask um and in this case of course my guest would be the best to answer all the questions that you might have so interact with us go in the comment section let me know um where you're listening from any question you might have any comments you might have i already have quite a number of questions that came in uh when i posted about this uh, session so i will be glad to share them um rightfully so on uh, at the very end of, of this session so please uh, take a cup of tea a cup of water maybe you're eating your food already maybe it's uh, of course it's 9 p.m in kenya so feel free um and and to interact with us and uh, you know let us know uh what you would like to benefit uh, from this session so without further ado uh today's guest is um uh, goes by the name uh, Stanley Geshobi, and he has quite a number of hats. He wears quite a lot of hats as well. And uh, I guess the thing is, he he better introduce himself because, you know, he, he knows a lot, a lot about social innovation, um, global development. Um, he's been through the Africa Compt Fellowship. He knows about business growth, business development, all this good stuff. And I think a little bit of IT, if I'm not wrong, well, you know, let him tell you about himself. So without further ado, let me introduce uh, Stanley. Stanley, how are you? Hey, Nyambura, nice to connect um, on this platform and uh, nice to, to hear from you. Yes, um, as you said, uh, my name is uh, Stanley Gichobi Mwangi. Um, mostly people in my circle know me as Gichobi Mwangi, but also comfortably can kind of Stanley. So I'm not very specific to the name. Um, yes, so I'll start by introducing myself. Um, um, of course, I'm a Kenyan, um, very passionate about Africa and development, and that constitute parts of my career. So I'm a design strategist. Um, what that essentially means, um, I work in designing um, different strategies that deliver um, exciting outcomes. So this could be in a corporate world, it could be in the development sector, and it could be in a sector that I've worked on for a long time, social innovation um, here in Kenya. So you're right, uh, I do wear many hats. I'm a passionate mentor to many startups across Africa, uh, quite a lot actually. Um, are supporting many programs uh, for social innovators and startups. But at the same time, um, I'm a senior associate in an organization I work with called the Global Development Incubator and trying to solve um, 
the global challenges, um, and specifically in the world and where I work for in Africa. So I support the team in strategy and innovation um, in a number of programs that we do. So my background, um, of course, we went to the same university and I was across on the, uh, the other side. Uh, I studied commerce uh, with a major in management mathematics. Uh, I've applied it, I'm not so sure how often, <laughs> but I'm very passionate about uh, general innovation, um, digital transformation, technology, and the best thing uh, working as a design strategist, you get to work across um, in IT solutions, non-IT solutions, um, strategy, and even now a very heated topic around digital transformation and how we can prepare uh, organizations, um, individuals um, for the digital transformation. So that's a uh, brief about me. Wow, wow, wow. Those are several hats, I must say. And honestly, I remember we were, um, for those who might be wondering, um, we uh, studied in Kenyatta University. Um, you know, some people always ask Kenyatta University, um, is that a good university to go into? And, you know, like we, we had lots of co extracurricular activities uh, way beyond yes. our studies every single, um, you know, day. And uh, yes. I, I must say for sure that uh, KU really uh, shaped our lives. And I think I'm so glad I went to KU because um, over and beyond the studies that we did, it opened mm -hmm. us up into into several things and even into um you know the global realm like uh really mm -hmm. most of the people that i know who have made it mm -hmm. very well across the globe some of them actually most of them i must say have mm -hmm. come from so that that's a good place to, to be at so kenyatta university is a good university guys um so now um you have all these several hats and i know we can speak about this forever for a whole day but today i want us to focus on africa Compt, and uh you know you must correct me if i'm pronouncing that wrong and um i, I want to know how you applied for this program so having won all these hats was it um, a period in your career where you're like, you know what, I need something different um, and I want to apply for an opportunity abroad or what exactly led you to apply for this program, bearing one that it is actually a German program, so I don't know whether you speak German in the first place. And um, of course, just what was the motivation towards applying for this, um, you know, program? And in fact, for someone who is listening to this um, session and is wondering, hey, I want to apply for this, but I just don't know whether it's the right program for me. So can you take us through how you got to apply? What's the motivation? And, um, you know, of course, give us a basis of what is exactly africa comped and guys if you're listening to this please uh leave your comments uh, right below let us know i cannot see anyone who is commenting guys are you still here or are you asleep so please please comment so stanley if you can go yes um uh, i'll start by providing the background and how i came to the ak as we call it africa comped um then i'll talk a little bit about how i applied and then um, I'll talk about the experience later. So I actually got to learn about African Comp, I think back in 2009, 2010. I can't quite remember, but I could have seen it in one of the magazines or a, a platform sort of. And um, I remember reading about it and I was actually excited and I thought it's a good opportunity. But then when I looked at that point, I didn't feel like I had the necessary qualif qualifications. Um, and what uh, was driving my inspiration for then, um, um, as you know, I'm very passionate about leadership. I'm very passionate about change, um, being part of ISEC, um, the global community, also oriented me into this, um, philosophies and perceptions about you know, being a global leader, being someone who creates change. And it opened up my uh, perspective on even looking up for you know, some of the activities around us. This is how I landed on um, AK, as we call it. So fast forward, um, 
um, now I'm in campus, um, started working a little bit earlier, even before I finished school. So I think on my third year, and I was busy and, uh, you know, I went through all cycle from internships, finding your middle in career, I'm moving from one organization to another. And at some point I felt like I needed a break. I need, I need to take a sabbatical. Um, I, I had very good um, African experience um, doing projects across Africa, but I didn't have a very international engagement. So this, this, so this came about. It was my first time to attempt, and I was actually happy I got it. Uh, to be honest, it is the only thing that I ever tried to apply and had no prior knowledge of applying. I didn't know how people apply for these things. I had zero clue, um, but I just went in with a lot of passion and applied. So that is my background to Africa Comps. And what I love about the program itself is what it stands for. And before I go to the application process. So the word Africa comes actually means Africa. Um, Africa is coming um, in, in German. And the objective of the program is actually to create a shift um, in a lot of global uh, perspectives uh, and in relation to development in Africa and saying, hey, um, actually Africa is a level player in the global sphere. And um, we can do the development work, which is amazing, has a critical role, but then how do we start building uh, streams of young leader who will actually come to Germany, learn from us, we also learn from them and become the future leaders in Africa that will drive the change um, and the agenda for change. So at the heart of Africa Comp, this is the force. And that's why the objective is usually very specific, targeting um, young leaders, um, passionate about change, passionate about learning global perspective, but getting an exposure on what it takes to work at a global space and translating that to specific outcomes in Africa. So the initiative is supported um, by the Private Sector Association of Germany. So it's a program managed by GIZ, but it's the top German companies that actually support the initiatives. Um, these companies want to understand Africa better. They want to authentically connect here. Um, they want to learn from us, even as we learn from them. So they've created this platform. Um, and, and the organizations have invested significantly um, in growing this. Um, and it's exciting. Um, the, the president of the Bundestag, uh, Mr. Steinmeier, um, is the patron. So it shows that it also has received a lot of support from, from government as a program with a very a key focus on growing um, next African leaders. And if you look at the alumni of the program, uh, this is what has happened. Um, we have people who have become general managers to representing some of those companies. We have a minister in Tanzania. Uh, we have people playing very different roles, uh, both in Germany um, and back in Africa. So, so this is the objective. Um, and these are things that were really uh, exciting for me to, to approach. So now we've learned about a key, learned about it. Uh, almost a gap of like nine, um, seven years um, between the time I read about it and I'm applying. So where do you start? It's overwhelming. <laughs> when you read their post, they receive like 10,000 applicants. 10,000 applicants wow. Wow. of very competent people across the Africa. Some of the smartest brain you've seen. Um, it's quite intimidating, right? It's quite intimidating. So the process um, is usually simple um, with a slight improvement now. Initially, it was, you go online, um, you download, you, you, you look at the opportunities because remember, it's a private sector-led uh, initiative. What I would also almost call a professional kind of exchange program. So, part of the experience is actually working in the organization. So they have to create roles 
within the organizations, JD, job descriptions within the organizations to create opportunities for us. So they would post and say, uh, we are interested and passionate with people in these career fields, in HR, in data and machine learning, um, in uh, quality assurance, um, in pharmaceutical, something, um, uh, in sales, um, in digital um, and social media sales. So they'll create studies. So the first step is the companies actually advertise jobs. And you go to the website, you look at the specific opportunities, and you actually apply for a job that everyone else is applying. And sometimes uh, the organizations will give preference based on where their interests are. They would say, we'd prefer someone from East Africa for this role. For this other role, we prefer someone from Northern Africa. For this role, we prefer someone from South Africa. And maybe for some roles, we prefer someone from across the Africa. So that's the first step. So you, are, you look at the JD, um, then you see if you actually match um, the competencies. And then through the online application, you submit, which is like a, um, a, a curriculum vitae, but now you have to digitally put it, uh, you don't attach it. And at the end, you have to do a personal statement, just like you're applying for any scholarships. And you have to build a case why you think this uh, opportunity to work in that specific role um, is value for you. Um, and what will what outcome will it have for you? What's your vision and uh, what are you seeking to achieve with it? So those are the steps. Um, a little bit twist in uh, that's changing is that now uh, we are seeing people being asked to share their innovative ideas. Uh, for example, uh, what are some of the innovations or an area you want to be working on? Sort of like you'd want to say, a project um, um, thing, but something that can actually be invested to in terms of money um, and, and or can be adopted by an organization. So that's the challenge. Um, and that's the first step. One of the hardest steps, right? So remember 10,000 people are submitting all these amazing things. Experienced people, multiple PhDs, multiple masters. <laughs> Uh, I have to say, I didn't even have a master's program when I was applying, <laughs> what at all. I just had passion, um, which I think is a very important thing in your, in your field because uh, it shines. So then uh, if you're lucky or you have a very not lucky, um, in Africa, we say lucky a lot. Fact is, if you have a compelling application, there's no luck. Your application has to be compelling. Um, and one thing you learn about the German culture that's quite interesting, they are very data-driven. They make decisions based on data, like this is standard line, German way of doing things. So it's not about luck and all these other things. It's actually about building a compelling application. So once you have a compelling application, you are now called for an assessment. And um, it's usually conducted in Nairobi, it hasn't changed, and I don't think there are plans to change. So you'll actually be paid for a trip to come for the assessment for two days, regardless of where you are in Africa. Uh, you'll be paid for the trip, um, your accommodation will be taken care of, and all your costs to actually come to the assessment center. So in my cohort, um, we moved from 10, almost 10,000 applicants to like 500 for 28 positions. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you're in the assessment center. I know you're meeting amazing, talented, passionate, driven people. I've never seen, like for me, it was such an exciting thing to see the kind of thinking we have across um, the region very competent people, very good records. And now um, they take you through now written assignments, oral interviews, uh, project um, group works. 
uh, sort of the kind of thing you do if you are joining, uh, say, a consulting firm. Uh, maybe if you're applying for PwC or McKinsey, the kind of experiences. Uh, very, very case approach question. So, so you finish the assessment, and now you go home and uh, you wait for feedback. Um, wow. Yes. So that does have <laughs> a, I mean, it's already a mouthful in itself because yes, what exactly. I'm wondering is in the first place whether they can consider somebody who's just freshly graduated, perhaps does not have much of experience, um, and maybe have they have a social project that they are thinking of doing, and um, yes. you know put this on their statement of purpose because usually it's you know it's a european thing you have to show yes. your motivation of doing things and why you want to come into into europe anyway so like is it easy or mm -hmm. rather what i want to mm -hmm. say is someone who has just graduated or mm -hmm. someone who doesn't have much of work experience a good mm -hmm. candidate for Africa, um, you know, as much as maybe they might just show that, hey, I graduated, but I, I've been doing this kind of project, which um, I think I do have the right experience from that particular project, whether it was a volunteer work or internship mm -hmm. or whatever it is, is such a candidate, you know, considered, or would you say that they are they only consider the top top notch, or what is it like though? Yeah. Yes. Um... The exemptions, um, by design, it's targeting young African managers by design. So by design, it's people who have had leadership positions at work, sort of like junior to middle level managers. However, based on the companies and the different needs and their call for application, you are able to assess. So you may not have uh, maybe um, a work experience, but you've been working on a project. And if this is exciting to the company, um, you definitely stand a very big chance of um, getting in. So I would say if you don't have uh, the necessary work experience, you can actually compensate that with something great that you're doing. And in my cohort, um, the average age was like 30, but we had people who are like 24, you know, um, who are doing amazing things and they actually managed to, to get in. So it's it's not cast on stone. Um, it can actually create um, these opportunities. Okay, and then again, um, in terms of the variety of the fields that you mentioned, because mm -hmm. you think about social innovation, people who are like doing mm -hmm. managerial work and, um, mm -hmm. Is it as diverse as you know someone in the mm -hmm. health field, someone in, in the tourism mm -hmm. fields, someone in, in hospitality? I don't know. Um, I mean, how diverse is it? Uh, the, the, the people mm -hmm. who are actually picked from um, you know Kenya. So, for example, you say that um, you know you have to look at the job descriptions on that mm -hmm. website first and see whether you match you know the description mm -hmm. that has been posted on that website. So. Mm -hmm. if, someone is, is in health or someone is in mm -hmm. tourism or somewhere somewhere else do they mm -hmm. even qualify yeah, yeah of course of course so um i would categorize uh, by the kind of adverts that are made so you'd have a big company because the, the, the participating companies are big uh it's people like uh um vw volkswagen where i was a global company, 750 uh, employees globally, and subs over 12 subsidiaries in financial services, in uh, consulting, in uh, production, and many things. You look at uh, Bosch, same, very expensive uh, in power tools, in uh, appliances, and so forth. So the the, the kind of opportunities are more connected to experience. Sometimes sectors do matter, but in others, they are actually sector agnostic and they are more interested in the experience. So for the big pharmaceuticals, for example, they have um, a very specific role. Um, like one of the most common, I know it's, uh, um, I can't remember the word, but it's like in quality assurance, you know? 
uh, and you need to be to have a pharmaceutical background to be able to even grasp uh, the terminology, the processes, and so forth. But I do know someone who was working in an auditing firm that works in Mac now, though they don't have a pharmaceutical background, but the opportunity was closely related to finance. So, so this is the nature of the opportunity that come across. So the JD itself uh, describes the kind of experience that you need to bring on board. Okay, that is quite clear now, because because uh, now I was wondering, uh, you know, um, we have several people who try to apply for these things, and sometimes you might just mm -hmm. be wasting your time uh, applying for it. Mm -hmm. So, if, if for instance, um, like uh, I have quite a number of people who are uh, also applying for scholarships, and they are looking to towards applying for Africa Compt as an option uh, for them to come and and experience that, um, you know type of, of, you know, German culture and how to do things the German way. Um, and I want you to talk about, you know, the fellowship itself, because there's, there's the application part that you did and you went through this mm -hmm. drill going into the interviews in Nairobi and meeting all mm -hmm. these kind of people and opening up your mind already while you're still in Nairobi without even mm -hmm. knowing whether you're going to be successful after the interview, you go home and you're wondering, mm -hmm. okay, uh, Will I go in or will I not? Um, but then there is the experience that I would like you to talk about. Like, um, one, what is the fellowship like? How was it like when you, you came over and what were you exactly involved in? You said that you were working for uh, Volkswagen. And um, what actually what I want you to start with is which experience, um, you know, was, was did you leverage when you are applying for this? Is it social innovation? Is it global development? What was it about your profile that perhaps was, was, was a good good fit for you to go to Volkswagen, right? Um, and then of course now talk about the fellowship itself. How was it and this kind of thing? So I think uh, what made me uh, become a, a good candidate, um, first and foremost, I did a lot of research. I did a whole lot of research in understanding how do you actually perform in a German interview, which is extremely, can be different from other organizations. And I'll give an example. You know, normally um, in East Africa, we are likely to work for either American companies, British companies, you know, and, and uh, the culture is very interesting because you can know the outcome of the interview based on the face of the person you're talking to. If they're smiling, they look interested, they're giving cues, they're like, this is actually good. Uh, but in German, uh, sometimes it can be someone just looking at you and you don't know whether you're doing well or bad. So that was one, and tips like those. Secondly, the German corporate sector is very data-driven, okay? So they want to hear specifics, you know. Uh, we haven't even talked about structure. They have extreme obsession with structure and how you engage. So these are the things I learned during my research. But what actually think cut me out even without having a master's and a PhD was a consulting background that I had. And, and often when I'm doing social innovation work um, in the modern day, um, it's quite interesting because um, you can apply like very McKinsey, PwC, you know, pain kind of approaches to social innovation, throw in design thinking there and human-centered cent human design, how you call it, it gives you so, sort of this structure of an idea. So, so when I went for the interviews, um, I was very aware of how to actually uh, present a case. So if you are into consulting, um, you, you'll hear a lot about case approaches to interviews. So they'll give you a complex uh, problem and, and how you pass is not necessarily on whether it's a good solution, but how you actually manage to, to structure the problem, structure the alternatives, build the approaches and do recommendations. So those specific things, um, they worked very well for me. 
Um, and it's because the department I was going to is an organizational development department. Um, and I was going to deal with working with lots of manager. So manager, so this was a very required skill for me to have. And uh, I had prior experience. It wasn't new to me, but also with a little bit of research, I was able to, to enhance it. So I can say that tapped. Um, and then I'll jump to the experience, but also um, ability to be very proactive and generally be someone who learns about perspectives in life. That knowledge actually pays uh, when you do these interviews. So one, well, one thing to add, um, an interesting deal breaker during the interview. Uh, and this disqualifies people a lot. It's your ability to be a team player. You need to understand this, and this is things I learned from research. In German, they believe in the team more than the individual. So if you can't work with people, then how can you be a leader? And this is a principle. Can you expound on that? Because everybody has that phrase on their CV, um, ability to be a team player. Exactly. <laughs> Start up act, right? Yes, yeah. and reading so, books and traveling. Go hand in hand. Can you expound on that and what exactly that means, you know? So, so, so what that means, um, how do you constructively engage your peers? How do you become a good listener, a good participant? Um, how do you play a critical role in a team without outshining everyone and looking smart better than everyone, but more focused on the goal and the outcome of the objectives? And, and, and that's a critical thing. And, and we will see natural leaders will come up and uh, leaders are not the people who are very bossy or anything, but they are people who actually add value in the critical uh, components that connect to the significant outcome that the team wants to achieve. So this is, these are some of the things that I learned um, as I talked to alumni, I talked to a lot of alumni and I wanted to know how was the experience for you. And they gave me this insight. So it's not, me being a genius and figuring out everything. It's actually uh, connecting to people, being very patient. Some of these alumni are extremely busy. You don't find them. Uh, maybe seven out of 10 won't even give an audience because there are other 200 people seeking their attention about the same thing. And they can only talk to two or three people at a go. But the ones that I managed to uh, were very supportive in terms of making me understand what actually this is and how um, it can influence Motka. So now we're done with the interviews. Um, you go home and within a short time, of course, everyone is looking for that amazing feedback. One thing uh, um, that I talk when I'm invited to talk about applicants, and I also had is, if you managed to go to the assessment, <laughs> even if you don't proceed, you are amazing. Like, it's very, very hard to get there. So when they are picking people, they're not picking people who are better than the rest. It's so much about fit so much about fit. And you know, some of this position fit is very diverse. Um, there's a particular personality they'd be interested in. There's particular, maybe some, some things that I, I can say are beyond your control. Because if you have performed well in your assessment, then um, that, that's good enough. And once you do it, even if you don't get the opportunity, it's not because you're not a good candidate. Now it becomes a factor of fit um, as well. And I'm seeing a question there. Uh, so, so the kind of questions you get both for written and oral um, are case, case, case approach, case studies. Um, for the listeners, if you can Google case approaches, you'll see a lot of resources. And this is um, uh, an approach that has been used a lot with uh, big consulting firms that say, here is a problem, um, solve it. We want to see, do you have structured thinking? How do you structure the problem? How do you come up with the options? And how do you do your recommendation? And even verbally, it's always a case approach. 
uh, kind of question. So it's not very generally related to if you're doing pharmaceutical, you're asked, you know, questions around pharmacology <laughs> and trying to remember the nomenclature of, I don't know how many things, not those sorts of questions uh, as well. So quick one. So now we finish the assessment, the interviews, you get your letter, you're excited. Some people are sad, some people are extremely happy. <laughs> Some people, this is their ticket to run away from all the problems in Africa. Some people are confused whether they should actually take this opportunity because it shocks them that big change is coming and now you are looking at what you have and is it worth to you? So there are all sorts of things. And you, you get prepared. Um, you get prepared. Uh, the first thing they do is offer you German courses. And that is for a reason. In Germany, it's actually very hard to get around if you can't speak any form of German. Um, they love speaking in Germany a lot, <laughs> obviously. I, know, I, know, um, I, know, I want us to go into that, but before we do that, actually, um, uh -huh. something I asked about the statement of purpose and whether Usually, you would have to structure the statement of purpose in like um, 250 words or 500 words, and what exactly you put into those into that statement of purpose. So before you can speak about life in Germany, because I want to hear about it seriously, I am yeah. super curious. Because I, I mean, I, I, even in the background, I actually spoke about this with you, and I think I, there's a lot to say. But before we go to that when you say something about the statement of purpose. And guys, if you're listening to this, Africa Compt is still open for application. So which means that uh, you can use this session to ask all the questions that you might need um, to ask so that you get ready to even apply for it. You have two weeks, which you know, you can shoot your shot within those two weeks. So, um, and one of the of the uh, requirements is the statement of purpose, and of course your CV, and that's another question I want to ask you: whether you you need to have your CV in the Europass format or any other format is fine. So those are two questions. So first, to talk, talk about the statement of purpose, and then the CV format, whether you need to to change it or because within Europe usually the Europass format is mostly preferred it's not a requirement but it's preferred as opposed to any other format so um speak about that first and then we okay. go to like Germany yeah so I'll start with the statement of purpose um it's usually very short uh so I think you don't do more than 250 words so it has to be extremely short um and 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 the case here that you need to build is how would this opportunity, how is this opportunity going to be significant outcome one for you as an, as an individual? And secondly, for you as a leader in Africa, like what is the value here and how would it be significant? So there are no, um, how do I say? There are no uh, specifics, um structures you know like in, in in academia if you're applying for scholarship the way you have to build maybe two pages a thousand words but this is where your creativity comes but the point is are you able to build a case um on how this is going to contribute um to an outcome for yourself as an individual and also for you as a leader and even for you as from where you're coming from um in Africa, in Kenya. There's a question if one had if one had supply and it wasn't successful, can they reapply? There are no limits. You can apply as many times as you want. Um, um, keep on repeating and everything. Now, about the CV, you don't have to submit a CV. You fill in your CV and the system will automatically generate um, the penal CV on their side. So just that um, there's no specific format where they ask you do it in this way, you just type it, they'll ask questions, and you know, like um, the, the, the box will come when you type in, once you finish, you click complete, it takes you to the next uh, box to answer the questions. 
Yeah. Okay. So, so mm -hmm. which means that any type of CV format is fine. But I mean, of course, you don't have. To you, you, you don't attach. You actually don't attach a CV. Ah, okay. You just type it in. Okay. Okay. Um, like the way you'd put it in a Google Forms and you know. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yes. Okay, so which means that the only requirement that you might need is the statement of purpose, and then do you need to show any type of certificates or any type of employer letters, um, you know, these kind of things, recommendation letters? Do you need to show any one of this? It's not necessary, uh, but during the assessment, they do want to look at your documentation to make sure that uh, you've graduated because there's preference to people who have graduated. So you need your graduation certificate for confirmation that you actually need it, they'll take a copy. But it's good if you want a career recommendation letter, it's, I don't know if it adds so much value, <laughs> but by the time you're going to the assessment center and you're able to build your case, trust me, uh, you actually miles ahead. But I would say just, just career certificates, uh, but in my assessment, they were only interested in my university certificate and nothing else. Okay, and it doesn't matter whether it was a second class, uh, no, division no. or upper division. No, no. Okay. Nope, no, nope. there's no preference, and this is because this is if, if if you remove the fellowship away part away from it, this is actually a job you're applying to, and those things come second to your ability to deliver. Okay, so good to know that. Um, uh, wait, somebody actually, Nina says here that there's a field that asks for some attached documents, actually. What would you advise we attach? So, yeah, I, I, so I, I'll give very um, conscious feedback because in our time, I wasn't required to attach, it, to attach anything, but um, I haven't looked at the system of late, but please, um, uh, look at it keenly. There will be direction on what to attach. Um, be sure you understand. But if you are struggling, if you just go to African Comp page and type in your question there, whether on LinkedIn or anywhere, they'll give you feedback, and they won't judge you and say, "This person doesn't even know to attach." <laughs> nah, remove that guy out. So uh, what I love about the AK team is that they are very supportive in preparing you to even submit the best application for yourself. So don't be afraid to ask. Um, I'll take that because uh, I, I finished my AK experience in 2019. So it's almost three years and I'm sure a number of things have changed around that, yes. Thanks for that clarification. All right, most definitely. So Nina, please uh, do your due diligence and of course just uh, ask in mm. case there's something that you need to clarify you can obviously send them a quick email the good thing about um any application within europe um usually there's a lot of help um and um, mm -hmm. you actually get a reply from those emails that you sent they're not just left absolutely. Hanging. absolutely yeah so now i want you to now circle back into you know your life in germany so you say that um you know they they help you to actually do some language course uh german yeah. language course uh, so that you can be able to get by and you are uh speaking about you know in germany you really do need to learn the language because they absolutely <laughs> love the language like <laughs> And one of the things that I actually curious is that is it that you know is it a working language when you're in the fellowship? Will you work in English or in German? So because that was another question that people were asking, or is it a mixture of you know everything uh, all around? And even the systems that you might be working with would they be in German or in English? And how does that look like? So let's delve into it. You are, I, I yes. stopped you before you, you went in, into it talking about um, the German language and the experience. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let's go back there. So yeah, so first preparations, learn German language, even as you wait, because you get the reply later quite early. So this means you are able to, to prepare yourself in time and you are able to spend a month or two learning Germany and you know grasp the basics. Why? because 
um, and, and perhaps, uh, I don't know about Portugal, I haven't been there, but um, in across most of the European countries that I've been to, um, in quite a number actually, is that people prefer their local language, which is usually the business language. So uh, there's a disclaimer that it also depends with the organizations you work in. In Volkswagen, the official language was in German. So you'll receive your emails in Germany, you'll do your PowerPoints in Germany, you'll receive your reports in Germany, all the meetings will be in German. Every literal thing, yes. Wow. And German, uh, I'm not very good with learning new languages, so you can imagine, but there's sufficient time to learn. So you learn here for about months, then you, when you land in Germany, for the first uh, three months, um, they invest in language classes, everyday language classes, because it's a critical point to your success, but also um, in addition to courses on leadership, understanding the cultural aspect of Germany and how to work in a Germany professional setup, sort of like the business culture. And I'll give an example. So if you're doing a PowerPoint presentation in Germany, you have to explain in most cases how your PowerPoint is structured in very specific. So you'll start by saying, here's my presentation. I have around 20 pages. I'll spend the first two pages uh, showing you some data. On the third page, I'll show you images of one, two, three, four, five. Then in the last page, I'll create an opportunity for you to ask questions, which is very different from my experiences where we usually go like, hi, I have a presentation about this. Topic one, let's go. And people sort of, you know, so, so this is a very small example. Things like time. Time has made people lose career in Germany. You can never be late in Germany. Trains don't get late in Germany. Buses don't get late in Germany. You do not have an excuse to be late. Uh, in Broadway, where you come from, it's okay to wait for someone for up to 30 minutes and you don't take offense. You actually take offense after four hours. Even one day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On the seventh day, it's been like, hey, what happened? We were to meet last week on Monday at eight, you know, right? <laughs> but there, it's career incriminating. Um, maybe aspects, uh, Germany as a business uh, culture, it's very, bureaucratic also, you know, the boss is the boss. Um, if you work in the startup community like I have here, and I'm sure because most African countries, most investors are American, there's, there's always a very easy culture. You can chit chat with your boss there. You know, there you enter and you realize the boss is actually the boss, <laughs> you know, there's a way you approach it. So there are these etiquettes um, that are very, very important. You learn about how to make friendships. For example, you're gonna have it rough. If you're lucky, you can know people. And knowing people doesn't mean they become your friends. It takes around 10 years for them to consider you a friend. Uh, we know in Kenya, if we meet at a bus stop, even if we never knew each other, we just talk about traffic. By the time we are getting where we are, we are best friends, you know? <laughs> So things like being invited to a party by someone in Germany, does it mean you're actually friends? You know, these perceptions. I lived um, uh, where I was living in Germany uh, for almost a year. I never saw my neighbor and we were only two in that block and I never saw them eye to eye. And that's how the culture is. Whenever they wanted to communicate, they give me a note. So these are aspects that they prepare you so that you don't take offense. You don't think like it's personal and every culture is very different. So they prepare you for that. Then you go to the work experience and the work experience is actually very exciting. What I love about it is the authenticity in the feedback you get as a culture in Germany. People are very authentic and very straightforward in their culture um, cause it's a very data driven uh, culture they focus on uh, 
they focus on what's, what's the point. Like, you know, they are very objective, not ex, not personal. They focus on, you know, like, 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 like the data. So they give you very straightforward, um, which is very different again from, I don't know about, but I know in most African countries that have been, uh, if here you don't constantly tell your team Oh, you guys are great, you're amazing, you're doing a good job, even for no reason. They feel like they don't belong to work. But in German culture, those are not things that you get every day. You're supposed to do your job nicely anyway, you know? So if you want to stay there and expect your supervisor to show you how much it's a privilege to have you in the company, you can't have it wrong. They'll wow. only call you and sometimes when things are only going wrong. So these are the cultural aspects. And then, of course, the seasons come with their share um, of experiences. Uh, Germany actually gets pretty cold. When it's winter, people uh, are, are just not happy. You don't want to cross anyone there. Like it can get pretty cold, minus 12, uh, almost cold. A summer, everyone is excited, you know, going. Um, and, and these are the things. But you, language you have to master. There are places you'd go where nobody understands English. Um, and, and even the buses, the signs don't change to English. So if you can't master language and you don't take your languages seriously, it's done. So now you go to the companies and you're working and you're building relationship. Um, a very good thing is opportunities even within the company will not come to you. Because the culture there is, if you don't speak about it and you don't say it, you don't need it. So you have to say what you want and very straightforward, you know, hi, I'm seeing an opportunity here. Can I actually engage? And um, I, I tried this and it really worked well. So I did lots of cool things um, in VW, um, I managed to host seminars with managers in VW. Um, I talked to different people from different departments. I even shifted department and I, I went to a very uh, another exciting department um, called Digital Transformation. Uh, you know, um, and 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 I even taught as a guest lecturer in a German university. And when I tried that, speaking out reaching out and being very deliberate. It gave me a lot of uh, uh, positive feedback to a point that I can say I'm happy that actually one of my supervisor is a mentor that up to today, we connect regularly and we talk and you know, we, we build each other. He gives me other connection and um, we, we, we transact money. And it's because I've seen people who've gone, uh, they've been, they, they become the nice person seated on a corner that never speaks, never says anything. And that's how you finish the fellowship and nobody will even remember your name. If you don't put the effort, if there's so this is part of it, um, of course, then there's food. Yeah, that, that's very, very, uh, very good point that you made because I always uh, talk about that uh, on this channel. Like, you know, Europe will teach you how to get yeah. out of your comfort zone and go speak to people, you know. It's it's not yeah. the way we are used to the Kenyan culture that, um, you know, you sit somewhere and somebody is going to come and say hi or, um, you know, you, you think that you don't need to speak to people because eventually maybe you will meet in a party and you make friends and all these kind of things mm -hmm. you have to be very deliberate and it's the same thing with the portuguese culture as well mm -hmm. um you know you need to be very deliberate to to meet up with these people speak to these people at work even make friends within your own circle or even within the community uh, as well because uh, again um in the first place you are actually a foreigner if especially you do not speak the language of the country who fluently, excuse me, then that is going to be an issue. And I think, um, you know, the thing that you mentioned here about um, the work culture is is quite very different from what we have in Kenya. Because um, like you mentioned That's first, you cannot get late, one, and then you have Never. to each and every one of your, your PowerPoint presentations, what it is about, be very structured, be very data driven because they want numbers. They want to know why is this happening the way it's happening, not just yes. to say it's happening like this. You know, you have to explain mm -hmm. yourself. 
and being so detailed. So this is something that someone who is actually applying for this program ought to be very ready for. So if you are picked, then you know, you would need to make sure that you're down to the letter, that you are crossing all your T's and, you know, you're making sure that- Absolutely. You know, you know exactly what you're getting yourself into. And um, I, I think that is one thing that we need to understand that the Kenyan work culture, the German work culture, the Portuguese work culture, we were talking about it last, uh, um, you know, uh, live video we had here. And um, I want you to talk about, um, is it a nine to five job? Was it an eight to five job? Or was it a nine to six job, 10 to seven, whatever? Or was it quite easy? It, you could go to the office anytime. And I know that, um, of course, you, you possibly had different activities every other single day because the fellowship is one year, correct? It's, it's a, a one year fellowship uh or, or 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 more i may be wrong i think it's a one year fellowship correct so which means that maybe you have mm -hmm. different activities at different segments of your uh, fellowship mm -hmm. um and and what is the activity type like and you know in terms of the german work culture um what what do, would you expect to work from eight to five or do you expect to work any time? Are they as flexible or are they super structured and you cannot miss the point for sure? Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Your last, your last point is that, and uh, this is not being, it being a good or a bad thing. It's a culture thing. There are discussions within Germany. How should their workplace evolve and look like? It, it's a big conversation. It has its advantages and disadvantages. But where German is um, as of now, it's a very structured work environment. So you actually be expected to be on job on time and live on time. Uh, keep time, meetings start on time, everything very structured. Um, however, you might find um, how your supervisor is might actually influence how the culture is. So I worked with different supervisors and one supervisor was actually very results driven. He's German, but his perspective is very results driven. So it gets to also one-on-one, -on -one. but in principle, uh, German culture is very um, formal and straightforward. Um, formal to the point that uh, small talk, uh, this is another a part of the culture shock. Uh, small talks don't, don't work in office setups, and you you just don't go and have small talks. And, and of course, you'd go and you start, oh, you know, Arsenal, I don't know, Trump, what have you, but people are not interested. So if you're talking, you talk about the project, the outcome, and you know, uh, and if you want to talk about those things, create time for coffee to talk about those things. And it's not random. People plan long, even for meeting for coffee or coming over for dinner, sometimes even a month ahead. And it's very normal in Germany to say, um, I love you to visit me next month, um, second Saturday. Then they'll tell you, on that day, I'm preparing to make meat like this. Do you have any allergies? No, then they'll tell you, we'll start with coffee at 10, then go for lunch at 12 and at around four, uh, we can leave. And when it gets to four, it's very like, yeah, yeah, thank you for coming. It was actually nice hanging out. <laughs> you know, like uh, our African culture is like, we go with it, you know, we go with it. Uh, well, let's go, let's, let's, let's see how to come. But there are people actually plan, they ask you in advance what you'll eat. Um, now, when you talk about activities, how it's structured, the experience is that you spend three months doing induction, learning about the German culture. Then once you're done, you go to work and you're working, 100% work. Once between the working experience, you'd have a one week workshop, uh, uh, um, amid, uh, a second workshop that you break to and um, some people don't even make it because of work. Uh, others make, it's almost a requirement. Then you go back to work. 
Then towards the end, there's a month of work where you actually finish off in a different city and you are doing your third round of training. Then after that, um, again, uh, depending with organizations and the opportunity and the strategy, uh, people actually get opportunities within the company. And what's been amazing is that over time, more and more companies have been taking more and more people in and giving them offers. But again, these offers, it's purely uh, your level of effort, reaching out, speaking, asking people what their plans. Um, uh, Germany, Germans are people who love to plan well. And this is part of their culture. And if you do, if you look at cultural studies, at one point, uh, Germany lost wars because of war planning. And from that point, they shifted this and they, they, you don't do surprises in Germany. So if you want to have a job within the organization that you've gone to, these conversations need to start, to start early enough. Prepare people, lobby for your case, connect, speak. They'll tell you, my department has no opportunity. If you actually want an opportunity, consider that other department. You can't wait until the time you're about to leave and you're telling them, uh, and work. <laughs> You'll be shocked. <laughs> then you say, oh, these people, you take me from Africa for one year. You know, but you never spoke. And if you don't speak, it assumed you're comfortable, you know? Because um, German culture, you only speak when it's not okay. When it's okay, that's the way it should be anyway. So why are you speaking? Like, you, it was supposed to be well done. So, so that's how it's structured. And, and that's how understanding their culture gives you leverage. And of course, then you finish, uh, other people get offers, they don't want to stay, they have different ambitions. Um, for example, I have my own different ambitions. And by the time I was finishing off my um, fellowship, I already had an opportunity, uh, had transitioned to a different organization here back in Africa based on what I was passionate about, what I really wanted to do, um, others got opportunities, then um, you come back um, to Africa. Yeah, so that, that's a very good point you touched on because um, if somebody is looking to, to go into this program and actually is successful, and after the fellowship, um, depending on the type of visa that they have, is there a possibility for them to even like look into other companies within Germany? Um, and I know, of course, there's, there's lots of visa, um, you know, issues. And in fact, if, for example, you are lucky enough to get um, like an EU blue card, you could possibly maybe get to have a job maybe in Germany or anywhere else within Europe. So there are these kind of things that I think about. So I don't know what type of visa that you go into Germany with when you get into this fellowship. And um, are you able to extend this visa towards another job? It doesn't have to be within the fellowship realms. Or do you have to for sure, for sure, come back mm -hmm. to your own country? Or if you do not get an opportunity within, you know, those companies that, um, you know, you used to work for, for example, VW. So how does that work? So first of all, uh, you get a residency visa, um, a Schengen residency visa that allows you to officially work because you can't be employed without it. And you'll pay taxes. Um, you have all the benefits of a residence. So there are instances um, where you are about to finish your uh, fellowship and you actually apply job in a different organizations and you get an offer. You absolutely can transition that visa to that because it's already a residence visa. Um, the company that you go to can support you in extending. What happens is that these companies in uh, Africa comes, they actually support you because you're coming to the first cycle of your one year residency visa. Um, then with good and sufficient notice ahead, um, you can get another year. And, and it's, it becomes much easier than trying to get a work permit when you're in your home country. So when you're there, you know, 
be open-minded, look for these opportunities, and uh, yeah, check both within and even um, outside your space, talk to people, um, try to network as, as much as possible. So it's actually very possible to do that. And they do okay. not limit you. If you're able to secure work, it's okay. But if you want to become an illegal migrant and go underground, you actually, as part of the agreement, you have to refund the money that was invested in you because your uh, you've invested this much then and you won't disappear they will find you they will find you so this is not your gateway <laughs> this, this is not an illegal gateway to europe yeah. which is fair enough you know which is fair enough um, yeah. I, I wouldn't expect someone passionate maybe you want to screw yourself by doing illegal things, because you not only mess yourself, you mess even the future opportunities. We've seen opportunities where people have come back to Africa, and actually in future, the organizations want to work with these people again. And they reach out and they say, hey, yeah, uh, come join us either in Africa or back here at home. So uh, being responsible also with the opportunities you get is very, very critical. I can see a question on, uh, cultural adjustment, anxiety, and depression. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about different people, but what I saw as a cycle is that, and especially like me, for most first timers in Europe, you will undergo a depression phase. So if you're passionate about some issues, then you go to a country where things are working. No, you, you will start maybe hating where you came from, you wonder if you really want to go back to that country, it can destroy you. <laughs> this is a very normal curve for everyone, you know? Um, and and, and Juta, you know, we've talked on this on the side, like, this is the reality. It's the reality, you know? Um, you go, you see a very different perspective of life. It can be very overwhelming. Um, also, anxieties on whether you're actually going to stay in Europe, are you going to get an offer? Are you not going to get an offer? It's a, a real thing. Um, and it can even cause depression, and especially during winter. Uh, I used to hear those stories of like, oh, people are depressing, and I'm like, what do you get to me? Uh, so you're depressed because you have stress, not only it's winter, but actually you can be very depressed during winter. When it's dark, you can't have vitamin D, you're not taking supplements. <laughs> It's a bad combination of everything, and people are likely to be depressed. Um, for me, reaching out to friends and having peers that we could talk to really worked well. And also, my mentor, it's called Falk Bote, was extremely supportive, and a colleague called Zilas. These guys were like my support system, uh, together with uh, a colleague that we went to Africa Comp called Shiko and we almost became like family. They would check in. They would once in a while tell me, oh, let's come for dinner. I think they went very huge. They made very huge milestones to make sure that I'm having a positive experience. And this really contributed uh, positively to my experience there. Um, but this wasn't maybe a reality to everyone, depending with where they are and the relationships they have. Um, another thing I did, uh, to deal with anxiety and depression, uh, I utilize the visa seriously. <laughs> Extremely <laughs> seriously. <laughs> I went anywhere that Schengen visa could take me. <laughs> and it was exciting. I went, I learned different cultures. I met different people who some have become friends. It was an easy way for me to also just relax and step away from thinking, anxieties and dealing with uncertainties. And that can be a beautiful part. In my cohort, I was the most traveled person. I was the most traveled person. And I actually purpose and I talked to my boss and I told them I really want to travel. And she was so supportive because when I come, we'd meet for coffee and she'd ask me, so tell me, what did you learn? What did you see different between us Germans and the Spaniards and the Italians? And I'll draw these comparatives and I'll actually understand the cultural differences better. For example, people in South of Europe are more outgoing, warm, conversational, they hang out a lot. 
but it's go towards the north, people stay indoors, they don't, they have very big boundaries and getting to know each other is actually a process. We just don't click and start talking. And these are part of things that have enriched me as an individual um, and part of my work, um, even as I do today. So one of the things I do at work, um, I work on designing uh, how we can create a sustainable employment opportunity among the youth. And that passion came from traveling and I'm traveling in this country and I don't see the level of uh, youth issues that I'm seeing back in Africa. I mean, when you go north, societies are working, unemployment is very low. So it bugged me, I felt like I want to do something. So these experiences can actually shape your passions and the things that you want to do. And that's why I, I preferred coming back and um, creating a change as a leader where I am. So it's definitely worthwhile. Absolutely, that is very true. And of course, uh, touching on the cultural adjustments and changes, I have been in Portugal myself. This is going to be my seventh year. And yes. the first year was one that was quite, quite depressing, obviously, because, you know, you're away from home and uh, you don't know the environment very well. Uh, fine, we had some Kenyans whom we came with, but still at the same time, um, you know, when when you meet up during the day, in the evening, you're all alone and, you know, you have to, to, to go for your classes because you have come for us. I had come for a scholarship. So you have to be present at, um, you know, the current activity that you're doing, whether that's work, whether that's a scholarship, whatever it is. And these environments, these are things that people don't actually speak about loudly, which is something that I am also trying to, to do and, and tell you what to expect. It's not to scare you, it's just to tell you exactly what to expect. Is it what you know, it is definitely worth uh, coming into this environment and getting to, to know um, something different from it. Mm -hmm. So because people shy away when they hear about, you know, extreme weather conditions, for example, mm -hmm. snow. And like you will go in some countries in the north of Europe where there's 24 hours of, of darkness and, mm -hmm. um, you know, countries like Sweden, Norway and Denmark, which will get maybe like maybe you're in Stockholm or in, in the capitals of these countries where you, you will find that during winter, it's dark at 2 p.m. and you are not used to that. You know, these are things that will depress you immediately. And uh, of course, like it's a health related thing, like Stanley mentioned here, it's, um, you know, you have to, to take your vitamin Ds. This is where your health, health comes in quite handy because as you interact with the environment, as you interact with the climate, the culture, you know, all these things will work towards the success or failure of the activity that you have come to do, whether that's work or studies or whatever it is. So beware of these things. They are not to scare you. It's just to let you know what yeah. to expect. Yeah. It's very easy to overcome them I, eventually. Mm -hmm. honestly, you find ways uh, of, of overcoming them. You get out of your comfort zone, like like Stanley mentioned here, you you keep traveling like like he did mm. to learn new cultures. Um, do you know? I think he 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 started cooking. He used to cook every other single day, and exactly. he used to post a photo of what he cooked that day. So we were all exactly. judging him and feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I had to pick a passion, you know. I had to yeah. read more, cook more, create. Yeah. And and you're right because. The truth is this experience can be completely horrible for you. They can be very bad experiences. And uh, your power dynamics, you're coming from an average African um, country. You go to a country that is very different from what we are used to culturally, economically, you know, everything throws you off. Uh, we haven't even talked about um, structural racism and aspects of intellectual racism and how people perceive you to be, you know. Um, uh, I, I did, anyway, I won't wish, but I, 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 I play like, you know, so, so, so is Africa. You know, you think your country is very big, but people generally can't find it on the map. They don't even know where it's located. Um, and they, they, they tell you about their friends in South Africa and your Nigerian, uh, you know, all these things are, <laughs> <laughs> you're like from Nigeria to South Africa. It's further from Nigeria to Europe, you know. Like that's and people some are very innocent because 
you meet Europeans that have never learned anything. You meet very smart Europeans. You meet damn Europeans. You meet all sorts of people. The best thing is that it breaks internal biases, you think. If you only think Europe is heaven, you actually reach there and you realize it's not heaven. And even more, when you go to the south, you start see, seeing people beg. Um, you start hearing this crime rate, and it's not your someone who looks like you that's robbing you. You know, it changes your perspective. Um, so the experiences you have depends mostly with your attitude, how open-minded you are. You know, um, LGBTQ. Um, you go there, you go to places where you know it's it's, it's their right and you call people names, you'll actually be taken to the police for discrimination and harassment. Um, you know, you, there are those, those many aspects. So experiences can be what you make them to be. But what I'll say, Luta, um, is that if you want to be bold, if, if I'm to advise someone who wants to try this and other scholarships, go for them. It's very important to step out, you can always learn something positive. It can confirm what's amazing. Um, you should have seen me demonstrating in PESA like this amazing idea. And people were shocked how we could move money in Kenya without internet. And, there was, and, and I, it, it was such a big thing. And it, it was a good point to say, you know, uh, we are not all about safaris. When you're talking about innovation, we actually far ahead with good coverage. You know, our internet penetration mobile is like 90%. In Germany, it's slightly above 60. So you guys are actually behind. So it also validates and you collect what's positive. Um, you see what's negative. Uh, you create experiences. You'll go to shops. People will follow you with, follow you with cameras. Um, an experience I had once uh, uh, where people maybe thought, and actually still, and, and I was actually genuinely there to buy the watch, and actually bought the watch. But I was like, or you go to a restaurant um, in, in the places and you enter and everyone looks like, why would an African be in this restaurant? Shouldn't they be cleaning or begging in the streets? So people have biases and the experiences can actually define you. But go, if, you, if you're open to these kind of things, go, you learn, you make friends. I've made people, friends who become like family to me, um, people that I always uh, go back to visit, uh, keep in touch, people that want to come, um, but also experience other things that maybe I didn't like so much. And, and I learned the maturity to deal with it. Uh, you know, in your, in your own country, you can make as much noise. Eh? But perhaps when you're there, you can't, something happens and the way they deal with it is very different from where you come from. So it teaches you to be very uh, open-minded and uh, respecting of other people's culture and processes. But I also think the key word here is respecting people's cultures and processes. You will not go and change Germans or change the Portuguese. Um, and the Portuguese can't come and change Kenyans or change this. Well, it might happen during the colonialism, but in the modern day world, they can't come and input things. We can only learn from each other and create very good boundaries of respect for cultural differences, yes. Yes, absolutely. And I want us to have uh, uh, another discussion for the last segment of this um, a live uh, mm -hmm. video. Um, and before we can do that, I see Maureen, you saying that you came in late and uh, kindly give a few highlights on how to apply. I guess you're going to have to watch this video back. Um, I mean, it's going to be on YouTube forever, really. So whenever you have some bit of time. But we've talked about um, pretty much the process of applying. It's still open until the 30th of March, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and, and the thing that you, you need to do is to pretty much go to that website browse through the job descriptions that um, Stanley mentioned here and see what actually reverberates to your profile. And, um, you know, of course, uh, be able to put up a very good statement of purpose um, and uh, apply for it, uh, knowing that, you know, for sure, don't just 
don't emotionally um you know invest yourself into the application because you may or may not get it like he said it's very competitive and so um the thing that you would need to do is to go on that website if anything is unclear then you can definitely even ask um the, the the committee that uh, the africa Compt committee by sending them an email and, and that kind of thing so i guess um I, i'm just giving you a very very few highlights really um and like he mentioned here is that the africa Compt is going to cover your language course um it's also going to cover um your visa fees i, I believe and also everything 100 percent so once you apply you get it you don't need to cater for anything on your side yeah. Only your attitude. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, yeah. So you know what? Yeah. Oh, that's that's right. Yeah. You know, you get away. It's it's how you come. But the, that's the most amazing thing because yeah. it's a good sabbatical. You spend a year. Yeah. Your rent is taken care of. You know, very decent uh, accommodation. Um, transport um, is taken care of. When you go to the company, they actually pay you. Um, the agreed uh, amount, um, so you are well taken care of. That, that's one thing that I'm really grateful for the fellowship, that I didn't have to work an extra job or have an extra hustle to make a living because they've done their very best to make sure that you focus on what's important uh, from the fellowship. Absolutely. So like everything is pretty much there. So you need to just shoot your shot really and 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 uh, see where that leads. And I wish you all the very best. If you're listening to this, obviously, I would wish to see that you put your best foot forward, apply for it, even if it's not this year. If you feel that, you know, you're not ready now because it's only two weeks, then you can definitely plan to, to apply for it in the following year. Like Stanley mentioned here is that, you know, he took seven years, a period of seven years before you could actually apply for the fellowship and he got it so i mean why not you you definitely can make it and so as we move to the next segment of this conversation it, there's something that you mentioned Stanley, about um institutional racism or rather what people try to say um institutional profiling or um you know looking at you sideways when you're in the office or whatever it is so um i know for a fact i will tell you guys that you know any european city you go to or any capital you will definitely find um the problems that are there you know in terms of even you seeing people begging on the streets that's very common or even pickpockets really in in a city like paris like is very artificial and all these kind of things you'll find lots of pickpockets the city is quite expensive in itself um you know like uh, there's a day i was making a joke uh, about this on social media that you can even find rats under the eiffel tower People think, oh my God, Eiffel Tower and, you know, all these kind of things. So each and every European city that you go to, whether it's in the north, the south, the central of Europe, the eastern of Europe, really, there's going to be a high and a low. So, um, but what I want us to touch about is, um, for example, when I came to Portugal, obviously, there are, I was in the university and you would expect that, you know, there's an excellent uh, team of lecturers and, and people within the institution that would not have any type of prejudices towards mm -hmm. A person who is black who is in actually the university and uh surprisingly so i definitely would find some some people in the administration or some lecturers who would you know question uh some very nitty gritties about you know why do you know this subject the way you know it how do you command a very good level of uh subject a b c d e and you know these kind of things and people side eyeing you and that's a thing that it's rarely talked about like you will definitely find the institutional racism and besides the institutional racism um the profiling within within different different european countries and how to deal with that that comes about with you know even how you relate with people from your own country because um people kenyans most of the kenyans that i speak to they're like oh there must be a very good kenyan community there and sometimes i tell them you know what i don't even quite relate with that community because at some point 
it's not as beneficial because you will find uh, unnecessary competition, um, you know, unnecessary talk and all these kind of things happening. And it's a lot. It's a lot. It's what to expect when you're abroad. And this is something that actually happens on the ground. And you're better off with friends who are from different other countries who are also in that country that you came into. So for example, like in Germany, maybe you meet like an Indian, a Pakistan, a Bangladesh guy or whatever it is. You're better off with friends from other different countries as even opposed to your own country. Of course, there are outliers. You will find one or two uh, people whom you can definitely relate to a good level, whom you can go with. But this is something that is rarely talked about. So let's uh, have a very short discussion about one, institutional racism or profiling. Did you find it in, in Africa Com uh, Fellowship? Uh, and of course, you, you can share the details that you're comfortable just sharing. Um, and, and how was it in, in Germany? How was the Kenyan community there? How was the racism there? Did you ever, you know, experience such kind of, you know, issues happening to you? How did you deal with this? And, uh, you know, guys, as even we, we, we think of ending this conversation, please send your comment or whatever question that you might still have and we'll answer it. So Stanley, please indulge. Yeah, thank you. How was it? So, so yeah. first and foremost, I'm very grateful um, in my professional setup. I never experienced. Um, I don't think, I, I, not only do I have recollections, but I don't have instances where I can say that I had this kind of attitude. I had very amazing supervisors, um, people who are very supportive, people who judged me based on my capability. And even when it was inadequate, they were very supportive, they opened themselves, they took time. So in the work setup, I personally didn't experience it. Um, I actually um, was very privileged to have such an amazing community. Um, and these are people that even today we have very deep connections and friendships. Uh, however, I had stories, I had stories of um, someone say, you know, power location of responsibility is done. Uh, how involved or not involved they are in uh, critical things, uh, even in the office setup. <laughs> and they could say like, low key, uh, I'm very competent. I have years of experience, but I can't be even trusted with any responsibility and not because I've not demonstrated the ability to, someone less competent uh, is actually given this opportunity. And uh, Germany as a country generally is it in, is it in a very interesting space. Um, there is a huge conversation. Um, one segment of the Germans are very open-minded, supportive, extremely open to migrants, and we've seen, and these are not people who are pretending, they actually authentically mean it. Uh, even the Syrian refugee crisis, we saw them going to receive them from the train stations and so forth. Um, so you have a segment and it's almost like 50-50 division from my just overlooking, not that I have any data to refer to, of people who are completely on side. But you also have very conservative people who and also open to migrants, think their society is diluted, um, that we shouldn't have, be having more migrants. Why are we allowing people to come in my country? So if you happen to work with someone from that segment, definitely it's a reality that you'll experience racism. And I've heard stories of people who have undergone this. If you're a woman, um, the kind of tackles you get from, you know, the middle-aged white person who is maybe racist and has this perception about black women. Um, if you're a man, um, how they socialize with you is differently. Um, but uh, as an individual experience that. Racism, I experienced a bit. Uh, for instance, um, I wanted to buy a watch once, and this person was just taking images of me. 
as I'm moving around and he wasn't even hiding the camera. And was that thing is, wow. Perhaps you think if it gets lost, you have a documentation of who it could be, you know? Um, but I was actually purchasing and actually purchased uh, to prove, well, I wanted to, but I actually purchased and I was like, you know, um, but because I was aware of, of, of this capability, psychologically, it didn't push me to the corner. Um, and uh, it's how you also perceive those people that are racist and some they lack proper proper exposure, it's ignorance, lack of proper education, lack of perspective. Like it's, it's a mixture of many things. It's about um, catastroph catastrophizing, you know, um, uh, social tensions and, 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 and all these conspiracy theories and things. So sometimes you look at those people with pity, not with offense, because it's, it's, it's a global world. Um, the world is globalizing, you know. Um, so, so there is. It's it's how you you perceive it. It's how you you perceive it. First of all, are you smart enough to know this is a taco? Where you're not too naive to think you're that um, like Shevanoa says, African. Hey, everyone is happy to see you. I don't know. Some of them actually be making jokes out of you. For women, they may want to touch your hair. I had stories like those ones. Oh, yeah. For women, they could not find salons for their hair. <laughs> and they went natural by force. And they had to cut. I had to learn how to shave because I couldn't get a black barber um, in one of the communities I live. So I went on YouTube and I had to shave myself. So all these dichotomies. Um, but structurally, it's still a big issue in a German society and a, a big portion of the German society uh, still struggles with the concept of migrants and having, no, but I don't think it's unique to Germany. It's most of European country. You can look at, 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 at uh, places like uh, Hungary, Budapest. Uh, you can see places like Poland um, and how they've been reacting to this, rejecting uh, refugees at the Belarusian borders. You know, if you if uh, you, uh, if you move over to the north, uh, you go to Finland, Sweden, and Denmark. They have some of the strictest uh, migrant rules. You know, for the, for those specific countries. So I don't think it's only German, but I also think because German is a very critical powerhouse in Europe and it's an economic uh, powerhouse. It becomes a center where many people would want to go. And that creates a lot of internal social tensions. Then combine that with ignorance, uh, conspiracy theories, um, it can become an extreme cocktail of disaster. So people would tell me, don't stand too close to the, to the railway line because We've had cases where someone was pushed out of racial prejudice, you know, um, still a little bit far. Don't go to particular concerts. Um, you don't know how people there would look like. Some have prejudice, they can actually go on you. Um, uh, I had people who, when they went to a club, standards were changed and apparently you had to dress this like this and this like this. But when white, people come in dress the way they were told they shouldn't be dressed, then they're allowed. But for them, they're told, no, 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 just go. We can't allow you. Like these things actually <laughs> happen. Uh, and I can't imagine the experience of the people have gone through. But for me, I can say I didn't experience that directly apart from the few recollection. And at work, I actually feel the people that worked with me viewed me more as a leader and a person who can actually add value. And it's evidenced by the kind of things I did and the kind of opportunities I was given um, as well. So I can for sure say that uh, I had a very different experience about meeting Kenyan communities, another African community. Yeah. I honestly didn't meet any Kenyan community people. I don't know where they are. Yeah. Uh, the truth is, 
Uh, I don't know about Portugal and how many Kenyans are in Portugal, but if you go to places where there are many Kenyans, you have different categories. You have people who are underground. And if you come through a, a program like Africa Comps, you, you almost can't relate. You know, they think you, you're okay, you organize us, you are here suffering. It's a shame for you to come and we are cool and we are body like it creates the cottons. Oh, you haven't met the people who are married to the whites. They are also a segment of their own. <laughs> oh, true. Yeah. Not unless they're also dating a white person that you can't belong. Because yeah. Can't connect, you know, and then you you meet uh, people who work for government, and they are there because they know who. Like yeah. there are so many segments of this. Yeah. Sincerely speaking, I didn't connect to any. I didn't go to any events. I didn't plan in any. And even friends that I knew when I tried to reach out, yeah. I sense the feeling like it's like people don't want you to come too close. But then there's always that group um, um, in other countries I went and there was outside Germany and I went to this group and you know, there's those groups of people want to come, meet for booze and all those things. And maybe if that's not your thing, uh, perhaps you also don't fit well. There's a lot of fakeness there. As you said, everyone wants to act like things are really working for them. Perhaps for some, they are not, and you can evidently see. So if you are doing well, um, they avoid you because maybe you'll notice. There are those who feel like you say, the ones with status and they have their blue cards. They treat you like this. So there are all these, I, I think, overwhelming drama that I don't even know. Oh, 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 no, Very yes. Yeah, so so for me, um, because I was there with someone we met in AK and we were working together with VW, we became family and we built friends and family around us. Um, and I also have a family member there who was there for me as family. So I didn't find myself living at night going to a Kenyan themed party. I've heard about them and I've not had so many good stories. And it's not only for Kenyan, uh, for the West African community to go, there's a barber shop for Ghanaians. It has its own drama. There's a place for Nigerians, it has its own drama. Then there's a place for Northern Africans, it has its own drama. So it depends on the kind of a person you are. For me, that's not my kind of thing. Um, I wanted to benefit uh, uh, with the opportunities available and they kept me so busy. And when I wasn't so busy at work, I was busy learning about other cultures. So I didn't get quite a lot of time to, 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 to get into these groupies and this, then I'm added in this WhatsApp group. I was in, I don't even know where the WhatsApp groups were. And even I talked to some of my friends and they're not in those things, but we know they exist and some don't have very good reputation. It's misleading, it's it's not constructive, um, um, it doesn't have a reputation of its competition. It's it's uh... yeah, that 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 is absolutely a mouthful because I, I have heard of, of stories uh in Germany, I've even seen it on social media a lot, and yes. I know there's, there's a lot that German uh, Germany can offer, obviously, one because if you go to study even a master's program there, I do know that there are several programs that you can go into which are actually free if you show that you can be able to take care of yourself within the period of your studies. Actually, a majority of public university, if, you, if you're admitted, you just need to prove you can provide accommodation. Absolutely. And then there is also the, one of the programs that I have spoken about, uh, uh, DAAD, that is also a very fantastic program, which you can go with to do your master's or even your, your, your PhD. And, and there's a lot, there's a lot that you can get from Germany in terms of also work. I've heard of people talking about uh, a, a, au pair that is au pair obviously it's, it's some people pronounce it differently and 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 um from from programs like au pair to secondments from, by companies which are maybe in kenya 
your second dad to go and work there and have some bit of experience there to people who actually look for work in Germany and actually get it if especially you, you show that your skill set is way, way, way high to an extent that they cannot find another European to actually get, you know, to do get to do that job. So, you know, some people who actually do get the EU blue card that I was speaking about before, because the EU blue card is for highly skilled workers who, um, you know, are able to show that for sure their skill set is way above what, you know, uh, Germany can get from within the European continent, honestly. So these are things that actually happen. So, I mean, but these, these are mouthful at the same time about what really happens on the ground and how you interact with the people who are there, the community that is there. And these are not things that people talk about very openly, but I, I'm, I'm so glad, grateful that you actually spoke about this. And Timothy here says that Keshopi has experienced the life. These tips are priceless. Yes, <laughs> he, he really has experienced within that short period of time, um, you know, mm -hmm. like, uh, you really, really went into it, and I'm, I'm glad that you immersed yourself into the culture and got to know, you know, the ropes of of mm -hmm. life in Germany and life in general, life in abroad, life in Europe, really. Let's say, um, and uh, I guess you know, I want us to end this conversation. Obviously, I think we have answered almost all the questions that I had before about, um, you know, Africa Comp Fellowship, uh, because they were basically about if somebody has applied before, uh, you know, whether they can be able to, to, to shoot their shot again, and what should they look out for in that case. Um, and I guess we answered that at some point. So I think we've covered pretty much everything there is to know about Africa Comp. The thing is, of course, like you mentioned here, it's not that you have to go back to your own country. If you are successful, you can definitely um, be able to to venture into into um, you know maybe education or maybe get some bit of employment within uh, Germany or maybe um, you know decide that hey you, you know what I want to go to another European country and maybe work from that European country. Of course, there are these things that you can be able to tap into, and you can even tap into Erasmus. I keep preaching Erasmus. Obviously, I have to uh, put in my good word for Erasmus there. So if you feel that um, you know you finished the fellowship and you want to maybe further on your studies, then you can even apply for for uh, you know an Erasmus program that includes. Germany um, and, and get to have uh, a feel of the life in Germany. But I have to tell you for sure that this, these tips and this, these experiences that you've had from Stanley here, they are not to scare you. They are just to educate you on what to expect when you go into Germany, whether this is also for Africa Corp or any other program that you might come across that involves the country. So it's good to know um, all these kind of things. And the thing about Germany as well is that it's very, very well located, which means that you're very close to, to countries like France, France, Luxembourg, um, and, and these are places that you can even tap into a to benchmark to know exactly what happens in these countries in terms of, um, you know, the work culture or even other different cultural aspects in terms of the language. You might be interested in learning uh, languages like French, which might be very, very helpful for you when you go back to, to, uh, to the African continent because you could be able to, to work in a Francophone um, you know, country or even things like to do with Portuguese. Like I always talk about the Portuguese language and how much it's, it's underestimated because you can be able to work in a Lusophone uh, country. This includes Mozambique, Angola, uh, Sao Tome, Cape Bard, and so on and so forth. So one, that thing that I actually learned from this session for sure is one, leveraging on the languages. So for example, if you really, really, really do, uh, you know, want to like, um, leverage on on your german language maybe you're in the university and uh you know you you have an opportunity to actually study the language the german language this can be one of the ways that you can leverage yourself as a candidate for a program like africa Compt, or even to go and study in germany as a self-funded student or even on a scholarship these are things that you can be able to 
begin doing as soon as now. And there are several platforms where you can use to even learn languages, things like Duolingo and uh, platforms like, you know, on, on Facebook, where you can find even people who actually teach the languages on, on social media. And you can leverage on that towards, you know, preparing yourself towards the country that you are interested in going. So whether that is in Europe or, um, you know, perhaps maybe you want to go to, to South American countries or whatever the country that you would like to go into, then you can do your due diligence and start preparing as soon as as, as possible. Um, and one of the things is the language. The other thing is, of course, uh, your skill set that uh, you have. And nowadays we have quite a lot of platforms that we have spoken uh, about even on this uh, platform you know we have things like udemy things like coursera if you want to learn some digital skills and elevate your cv you know things to do with um uh, team team uh, leadership and team skills and all these kind of things these are things that you can learn um and and things to do with even project management and uh you know perhaps maybe you also have a project within kenya that you're trying to to come up with um it could be a social project whatever the type of uh, of project is it is you can be able to maybe um you know make sure that you work on it so well that it works as part of your your experiences or part of uh what you would add in your statement of purpose for africa comt or even for any other scholarship really so uh there's a lot there's a lot that uh you can learn from this video obviously and from from stanley and uh, thanks to him for sharing all this uh, insight and um as we, we, we come towards the end of this this uh, live video, I would like for you, uh, Stanley, to just give us a parting shot because people always come to this channel and they're like, hmm, Africa Compt now. We are talking about Africa Compt. It's a very far-fetched opportunity. It's not for me. Maybe it's for them. It's for, you know how Kenyans we are. Um, uh, it's, it's who you know, or, you know, if you don't know someone in a, a big government position or whatever it is, or at all a relative who can be able to, to you know, push your name into a certain program um, we shy away from these experiences and these opportunities that are out of our own comfort zone which is kenya which is out of our country and in most cases you find people saying doubting themselves or discrediting themselves before they can even apply for the for the opportunity that is available so i don't know what would be your parting shot for somebody um you know who has this kind of thought process um and thinks that maybe an, a program like Africa Compt is a way far-fetched thing for them. Um, I don't know what you would like to say to such a person before we can end. Uh, what I love to say is, first and foremost, it's not far-fetched. Uh, what I love about some of this opportunity, they are very equitable and they are very fair and just. Uh, you're dealing with people who don't know anyone precisely, um, connection is not a very big practice for Germans uh, in that sense. Networking and being aware of opportunity is one, but even when the opportunity will tell you apply. Connection is, oh, I had this job apply. Uh, <laughs> that's connection. It's not like, give me your papers and I'll see what I can do about it. <laughs> so that's a good thing. I mean, if you're someone who want to pursue opportunity um you believe in your abilities you can do this but also i want to put a disclaimer and i'll give an example with myself um when i went for this uh i don't think i was as good as people i met you'd meet people with two phds you've met people who did their you know, or got a scholarship for their undergraduate in US, got another scholarship for masters in Canada, uh, did their PhD in Europe. And they're there. <laughs> and they're thinking, what am I doing here? I must I must single out West Africans specifically. You know, you meet well educated Nigerians in suits, proper suits. <laughs> Hey, just the appeal. I, 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 I remember that time because I, I was very busy. I had not shaved. I had not tie. I think I had a maroon trouser. 
a gray blazer. Like I was completely off. Then the person we became friends with, he was just like me. And another guy also was just like, like we were, we were looking off. We were like, I don't think this thing is like guys here are, guys here are good. But we all actually got in. And sometimes it's about boldness. Um, and, and I remember every year I set my goals and I pick a theme. For that particular year, my theme was being bold. And uh, my theme was, let me go for those things that even think like maybe I don't deserve. And I actually went for it. And I talked to my friends and they were like, well, actually I'll apply, you know, I want to be bold. I know the guys that make it to AK, uh, they're very good guys, but let me just be bold. And that boldness is what I took me first. So for people who feel like, hey, can I really compete? I'd say, don't look at everyone else. Focus with what you're passionate about. It's passion that gave me the opportunities. Uh, I had, as an experience, I'm one of the people that had a, an amazing experience from the fellowship overally by how I was engaged in my work, the kind of forums I did in my work. The, like, it, it shifted in a very positive way to a point that um, I, I always feel proud of myself being bold and not looking at the fact that I don't, I don't even have a master's. And I was an interview with people with two masters you know, and, and all of these things. But if you're just passionate and you're driven, that's all you need. If you lack those things, then you're very inadequate. That one, feel, please feel free, feel inadequate if you don't have those things, because that is the most important thing. The rest are, yeah, being with a PhD does not translate to being capable and passionate. You know, it's a good thing to have it and it can give you milestones if you're passionate, but you can have it. And if you don't have these other things, it, it won't create uh, opportunities for you. So it's how you view these things. Um, I'll finalize by saying this, Anduta, you asked me if, was it a lifelong plan? And I usually have it on my diary. When I, so I do this like, annual goals, but I also have like 10 year goals. So the first batch of my 10 years goals in my 20, for some weird reason, and I've written it down and I keep on showing guys, I wrote, I wrote there, I love to work in an international company. Uh, I don't know why I picked German. It was like, I love to speak German and go to German and be this international consul. And I specifically wrote in very specifics, um, things and maybe because of that, just writing the goals down. And as I went on, your mind starts noticing the opportunities that are close to the goals that you want to achieve. It's like if you want to buy uh, a, 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 a Toyota uh, or a Mercedes Benz, you start seeing Mercedes Benz everywhere. So your mental models change. And when your mental models change, you're increasing your probability of noticing opportunities that come along. So it's about what's your vision, what do you want? Um, I've also seen and uh, sad stories of people who've gotten these opportunities, but they've never been able to convert them to anything at all whatsoever, whether it's a scholarship, it's a fellowship, nothing. Um, uh, I've seen, whether this is fact that I once experienced two people with a prestigious master's in international development from London schools of economics, asking me if I could create an opportunity in the company for them to do admin work. This was completely heartbreaking. Wow. Yes, the, yes. And I remember we went for this design session and it was by Philips Design, it was a big thing. And me there with my missing marks from Kenyatta University, not even <laughs> I'm a facilitator. And this person is a clerk. And I could not phantom, you've been in LSE, like <laughs> yeah. LSE, it's an Ivy League. When it comes to development studies, LSE is like top five. But they were unable to convert it. They were unable to convert it to something meaningful. So... It's, it's, it's strategy, it's many things, 
perhaps now I can even say luck, perhaps, but you can actually treat luck uh, by how you align yourself. Um, yeah, and that story from LSE was completely heartbreaking. For me. I've never forgotten how someone with a master's in international development from LSE was seeking a, 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 almost a secretary job in my organization. And it's not someone who's desperate and just needs to put food on the table. They have the safety nets, they have everything, but they can't convert every, the experience into something meaningful. So it's about mindset and approaches, yes. Thank that's you. Very Thank true. you that's everyone. very, mm. very, very true. I mean, like Stanley, you, you, you really hit the nail on the head. It's about the, your mindset and what you do with what you're presented with. Like you, it's okay to come and do a, a scholarship for you to get, um, you know, um, title before your name, get doctor, whoever, or MSc, MBA, whoever, whoever. But at the same time, you know, the mindset that you have in it, you know, you, really, it will make or break you. Honestly, that is very true. So, and then, and then the the fact that you have to have the will to go for something you know like if you're passionate about like you talked about passion here if you're passionate about a certain project go full throttle for it without second guessing yourself about you know who is gonna look at me sideways or is it going to match up to to what you know i maybe studied or whatever it is really just grow and go with it and 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 go for it full throttle be very passionate about what you know you envision yourself being like you said you had written this uh, kind of things like you want to study german you want to work in an international company like you had envisioned this and you kept going for it so i guess that is a very 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 good place to leave it at and i would like to especially thank you for hanging out with us for one hour 55 minutes uh two hours per se um yeah. and, and and i guess you know there's much that we can talk about honestly even in the future we haven't even peeled off the other hats that you actually wear and all these kind of things that you do amazing things that you do and guys if you want to um reach out to, to to stanley obviously you can reach out to him on either twitter or, or or facebook um i i think i did tag him on facebook as well yeah so you yeah. can you can reach out to him on any one of those platforms but please be very respectful don't just say hi he would not answer to a just a hi message i am sure yeah. but he, so introduce yourself very well and and what you would like to know absolutely about all these kind of things and if you would like um for him to maybe uh chime in into your application for africa comp to definitely reach out to him uh for that so thank you guys for hanging out with us oh i do see uh her love is queen thank you so much for joining us and everybody else who joined us um you know on and off and if you're listening to this much later please um again feel free to reach out to any one of us in case you have any question and um again of course i'm very open to other topics that you guys want us uh, to discuss and i will be very 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 mindful of, of of inviting more guests who would speak into your uh you know topics that you would like uh, me to discuss on this channel so thank you so much for um you know staying on for the two hours and uh i guess i'll leave it at that and until next time please have a very good afternoon good morning good evening um good weekend wherever you are and until next time see you later guys Goodbye.